when prior, like I said, the radar down in day, uh, daylight, um, you know, didn't pick it up, but one of the flights that they had going uh, over towards uh, Cambodia, uh, they, they find this, uh, they see the, the plane, and they, they sent me down there um, to try to try to make out what's going on because it was a paranormal event. And uh, because I had training in paranormal um, paranormal activity, um, they really didn't have... See, Project Blue Book shut down in December of 1969. That's when Project Blue Book shut down. And Project Blue Book was primarily within the United States. Okay. And so you have some guys that are from Area 51. They're, they're wandering around in Vietnam. And I just happen to be one of them and just happen to be in that area. And that's where uh, they had all the scientists and physicists that was at uh, De Lat. So they were uh, utilizing me uh, for that for that for that uh, period there, um, and you know they had had you know a few years prior. Uh, you have to remember two UFOs sunk a uh, a, a patrol boat uh, down towards the DMZ zone, and it went out around the Tiger Island and uh, it attacked a New Zealand. Uh, a New Zealand um, patrol boat, Coast Guard boat, called the the, the, the Hobart. Um, I happened to, to have been on the Hobart, uh, and I had had uh, experience with the uh, the Green Ghost. Uh, the, there's a, a legend about the Green Ghost on the Hobart, uh, but what that was was uh, basically an entity that had on a um, some cloaking device. Uh, they could, you know, uh, camouflage themselves, uh, the Hobart there. So, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're right, right up in there. That's, that's the boat that uh, was sunk. Um, um, well, it wasn't sunk. It was... Uh, badly damaged uh, around the Tiger Island. Um, you know, we had, like I said, paranormal activity in Vietnam, and and nobody really did that kind of stuff. But, you know, uh, me being, um, you know, from Area 51, I, I'm just in the area. So... Um, but let me get back. I don't want to get off on the Hobart here. Um, but that's one of the cases, I, you know, that I was involved in. Um, so getting back to the um, to this aircraft, you know, I find the bodies. They're strapped in the plane upside down. Oh, DC-3, DC-4. And they have no skin. They have... Uh, their skin has literally been pulled off of their bodies. You can see their muscles. And then that they were upside down, the plane was upside down. When I looked on the roof uh, where I was standing, on the inside of the roof, there should have been blood uh, that should have dripped down and, and gotten uh, on, on, on the roof there. There was no blood in the in the plane, James, uh, there was not one drop. They were just, they were skint alive. And uh, so, I, you know, at this point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what the shaman had said, that they had found, uh, sometimes they would find their, their men with no skin. So, I'm I'm still perplexed. I didn't know the temple was back there. You know, I'm thousand over a thousand miles from um well over a thousand from um Long Tring. 
So um, you're at Anger Watt right now? I'm sorry, what'd you say? You were at Anger Watt at this point. Well, the firefight actually broke out between the lake and, and, and the temple down in the uh, that little slough there. So, you know, tiger attacks, um, you know, there, there are quite a few people that's been, been, been taken down by tiger. A 400-pound striped tiger would eat you alive. I, but while we were trying to get back uh, to our initial point, the radio went off, and it's the 506, and they said, and we were the nearest ones um, to them. Uh, they're, they're very frightened. They're, they're very scared, and there's a creature. They're observing a creature. Okay, they they thought they were going to go in there to uh, to hunt down the Camer Rouge, and instead they've encountered a creature. I, so, you know, me and the other guy, you know, we're on foot. It's going to take us a day or two to get up there, and. Um, yeah, you could do 30 miles a day if you're in good shape, you know, uh, just walking. So we get up, we eventually get around the lake, and, you know, we get to where the 506 are bedded down, and, and, and uh, they gave the binoculars uh, to to the officer that I was with and then he handed it to me and I and when I looked through the binoculars I saw uh, a bunch of bodies they hit the uh, this this the, the what had happened the Cayman Rouge is all being killed their bodies are cut up uh, the legs were cut off at each joint the arms were cut all the torsos were, were, were in a neat pile. They had the heads in a neat pile. You had mixtures of, of um, soldiers, and they also had some blacks. So I think it might have gotten a hold of a possibly a stray uh, black GI. Um, but what was happening, there were these barrels uh, and it had to have come from the Camer Rouge because uh, they were military barrels that had, uh, you know, you could take the lid off and it had a band on it. And they were, what I saw, I saw some little grays. And they were, and I also saw some humanoids. Um, and, the, and these humanoids, they looked like midgets at first. You could mistake them for, for a midget, but they looked like they were Caucasian midgets, but they had on a strange uh, helmet, and they had on some type of body armor, uh, like like you would put on a, a flak jacket, you know, to, to repel shrapnel, you know. Well, they had something similar, but it, was, uh, it wasn't as thick as what, you know, what we had. And what these creatures were doing, uh, they were collecting the body parts. They had dissected your body. Hands in one pile, ankles on another pile. Just every joint that you could bend is what was cut. And the cuts were not bloody. They were cauterized, you know, like a laser cut. Similar to what you might see, uh, like the cattle mutilation that has occurred in the, sta the states here, it, it seemed to be uh, dissecting the bodies, and they were taking the, the, the body parts and put them into drums. And anyway, you know, you, at different angles, you can see different things, because it's a jungle, you know what I mean? Like, then you could have somebody from one side that could, could see 
a part of it and you could be in another part of the jungle and you could see the other part of it. It just, we all had different angles. But what I saw was a spear, kind of a spear shaped spacecraft. And it had, um, I want to say it had four legs. Some people stated that it was three legs to the craft. But what I saw was four landing legs. And um, it was a spear. And that was the the spacecraft was was in in, in my sight. So what happened when it, the order was gave to open up fire on them? Um, and I don't know who fired first, but they had the five oh six open up fire on them. This is right after we got there, and there was a firefight that occurred. And one of the humanoids was shot in the head, and uh, it was killed. But uh, between the helmet and, and the neck area, uh, there's there was no protection. But if you had shot with the suits on, if if you you could take a a high powered uh, slug, and you could shoot them in in, in the in the torso. And, and you couldn't, it could it did, it didn't phase them, okay? Uh, our weapons were were useless against the suits they had on. Um, but what happened is startled the creatures, and a firefight broke out. Uh, they, uh, some of the creatures came out with weapons, and they were firing their weapons, and the 506 they were firing was returning the fire to the enemy. And they they grabbed the the humanoid that had went down, and they pulled him back onto the craft. And then I I heard a humming noise, and it lifted up. I would say about sixty seventy feet in the air. And what I am seeing, I'm seeing a. Uh, uh, electrical discharge similar to the Tesla coil. If you ever seen the Tesla coils, they give off like an electrical. Uh, they're not. It's not like. It's kind of like lightning, but it's it's giving off lightning bolts, and the lightning bolts are changing color. Uh, some of the lightning bolts were green, and then it would change to uh, to red. And then back to uh, yellow. And then it was just sitting there, it was humming, and it let out some type of an audio alarm. It was a high pitch, uh, an acoustic weapon. And, and immediately everybody dropped, or at least I know I dropped my weapon, and I covered my ears. It was the most painful. Uh, event I ever had. Um, it hurt my ears real bad, and it, 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 if it if you had encountered it, you would fall. If it, if it had landed in a football stadium with ten thousand people in it, and that audio alarm was to go off, you have seen ten ten thousand people fall to the ground. It, it was that it was that kind of intense pain, and um, so. Once it let out this audio alarm, it it went from a circular. The craft was circular like a spear. It turned into what I saw was was like a diamond shape, and I and I'm thinking that was the force field, that when it put the force field on. I could see the spear turn into a diamond, and it was a very, very intense light. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like a, uh, like a prism, a, a prism, you know, that uh, if the sun hits it, it, it sends off different, it sends light off in different angles. Um, and this thing descended into the air, and it, and it went off. Okay, well, 
but the time that time that it that it left uh it took us a few minutes it took at least it took me at least a few minutes before i could get up and i was real sick i was nauseate i was like vomiting uh real disoriented okay um it, it took me a while to get up and i'm puking and I, and my ears are hurting uh i'm still you know it's ringing i can't hear anything for the ring in my ears but eventually i was able to get up and get to the other other the other members of the 506 and um you know we we the bodies and the containers were left behind okay when this craft took off the the Camaroos, their bodies were left behind and everybody shook up pretty bad you know um you know you're thinking you're fighting the enemy and you're not fighting the enemy so you know after we got organized uh i told uh me and the, me and the other officer were talking and it was determined that since the parachute was about a few days south of me um you know somebody needed to go back out there and try to um you know find if you know this the individual from that parachute you know could have survived the jump and may have been trying to walk out of the jungle so might might have been injured the the you know may have gotten out of the jungle um but you know that was kind of like i said my first thought a tiger might have got him but the other officers say well maybe he's still alive maybe you know uh he's injured and he's trying to walk out jimmy w did you go by the name of rambo at this point no i went by the name of dutch if uh if you watch the movie uh when um Arnold, Swait, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's he uses a name Dutch. Well, I was using that name Dutch at that time. Um, but getting back, um, it was determined that I was going to go back down the river uh, and try to locate this 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 diplomat. Uh, that might be injured and walking and and if all else fails I was going to build a raft you know get into the river and travel at night you know because uh, you know you can travel nobody can see at night down the river and if it did start to rain the river it takes a while for the river to build up speed you know um, but eventually you know, I would, would float back down the Tony Sap River to the uh, the Mekon River, and then from there just, you know, come on back down uh, pa through Cambodia back up into uh, Vietnam. And uh, even if I was out in the river, you know, they would have seen me by, uh, by helicopter or by plane. Um, so... When I got, when I was on my way back, um, you know, to, to the uh, to the parachute, I, you know, left the parachute, the the abandoned parachute, and I went back towards the river, and there was a Viet Cong trail. All right, apparently, um, you know, there's been trails back there for hundreds of years and uh where people walk back and forth well i thought well maybe the guy had gotten on one of the Viet Cong trails and since it ran parallel to the river and i can hear the river you know as long as i can hear the river i'm not going to get lost so i was going to go ahead and walk the Viet Cong trail and really document it uh we need to know where these trails lead to which this was a trail they were using when they came down into Vietnam. Uh, 
there's a highway there now. I think it's um. Let me see if I can get the name of the highway. It may be Highway 6 or Highway 7. It's one of those. But it runs parallel to the river. Uh, that used to be a Viet Cong Trail. But anyway, when I'm walking, and I was walking south, I might, I might have been going for about a day or two. And the jungle... Is a very noisy place. There's all kind of how many people uh, were with you, and your in your group. I'm by myself at that point. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other uh, officer, uh, the paranormal other other paranormal officer, has um, gone back with the 506. It was determined that I would just head south. And walk a ways and uh, try to pick up the trail of this uh, um, this government official. And I'm not and I'm not frightened of the jungle. I mean I I mean I know the only thing I the worst thing that can happen is, is a tiger. And because the monsoons come, even the animals know to to get out of there. You know what I mean? The animals sense the river. So every, everything's backing up. It's just deserted back there. But when I was walking down the Viet Cong Trail, I found a body. And it was one of the Khmer Rouge uh, rebels. And his head, his head had been taken off, and it was cauterized. Uh, and I'm very perplexed, you know, uh, about this because of you know what I had seen back on the other side of uh, Tony Sap Lake those bodies were cauterized as well but what was unusual his rifle um, was twisted now you know everybody knows you could take a rifle and lay it on a street and run a tank over it. You know, you, you can mutilate a rifle that way. You can also take a rifle and put it in a vise and take a monkey wrench and twist it. And when I looked at the rifle, I'm looking for the, if you put it in a vise, there's grips on that vise would leave a, a checkered pattern. There's no checkered pattern on it, but it's like, if you took your hand and put on a bottle and you took your other hand and put it on the top and was going to twist off the top from a bottle, from a drink, his rifle was twisted. I had never seen a rifle twisted. And it took a great amount of strength to do that. And I'm, I'm perplexed. How did his rifle get twisted? Uh, so what I did, he had ammunition on him. Uh, I'm not going to leave any ammunition behind for the Viet Cong. So um, I took the belts of ammunition off of his body. Um, and, um, you know, took it with me. And went ahead and left, you know, going south. But the further, you know, I went on a ways. I might have been about towards later that night. I stopped to take a drink out of my canteen. There's there's no noise in the uh, the jungle. Quick question. Uh, did the creature heat up the rifle? Cause no, the no, no. It was bent by force. He just, he took it and twisted it like you would twist a cap off of, of a plastic bottle. The barrel was twisted. All right. But what happened, getting back, when I stopped to take a drink of water, there's no noise. And I'm very perplexed. I had never, you know, I never encountered that. There's no noise. There's no birds. There's no nothing. The jungle is quiet. And, uh, you know, me being psychic, you know, 
you know, I thought, well, maybe there is a tiger that a, a young a young tiger back there that just, you know, don't know that it's time to leave the, the area. So I'm still thinking, you know, it's a tiger um, that's, that's back there. You know, I, the creatures had already left, you know, several days earlier. So I went ahead and bed it down uh, found a tree, and um, back then you don't need a, a a tent. What you do is just find a tree and lean up against it and go to sleep. And the only thing I need is about two hours of rest. I'm I'm I was trained. Uh, you know the government says you know you only need about two hours of sleep to function. So I went ahead and and went to sleep and I got up the next morning and um, you know started moving further south it's still quiet I got another 20 or 30 miles stopped to get a drink of water from a canteen and when I was drinking my water I was looking around just kind of scanning around um, and I seen a branch that had been freshly broken up in a tree. I think the branch might have been about six, maybe seven inches in diameter. And it was broken. It was a fresh break. So I got to looking at it. You know, it's getting towards sundown again. And uh, I thought I saw something. It was a little blurry. And I was just kind of looking at it, you know, trying to figure out, you know, the tree didn't look right. And then I seen its eyes. It was um, kind of lit up. I, I could see what appeared to be some eyes. And I, and, and I could see that the branches were, were moving a little bit, the leaves on the branches. So there was something in the tree, and I went ahead and pulled my pistol out, and I took a shot, and it and it startled the the creature, and it and it started to move, and I immediately just you know emptied my ammo in my from my pistol, trying trying to hit, trying to hit whatever it was. That that's what I saw there. Um, so it looked yeah. like looking like it was semi-translucent and had yellow glowing eyes yeah it's that that part there is act is very real except there's no other actors involved it's just me alone you know those other individuals in the background were not there when i saw it okay okay yeah. i'm by i'm by myself the 506 is back north all right so that's kind of what the the camera rouge guy looked like except his head was gone um so i know there's something in the jungle at that point that i'm not alone i don't know you know apparently when this spacecraft took off it might have left he might have been part he might have been with that spacecraft and he was just simply left behind okay so he apparently was left behind and it's just me and him in the jungle so what happened james is um you know i'm trying to get back to the river okay I really need to try to get back the river. Um, you know, I'm at this point. I don't have no more ammunition on me. The ammunition I do have is uh, what wouldn't fit my pistol. Okay, it's a different caliber. So I have, um, you know, that ammo on me, and uh, you know. When I 
went on several more miles, and I came upon a bush. It was a cocaine. And I thought, you know, maybe the 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 Cama Rouge, you know, they were using this, you know, this uh this cocaine. And I was familiar with cocaine because uh, when I was in South America, uh, Manuel Noriega, I, I've been all uh, down in uh, uh in the jungle uh, down where his base camp was, and and I knew what cocaine uh, cocaine was, uh, the leaf was. So I went ahead and picked some of the uh, the leaves off the cocaine plant, the shrub, and was going to, you know, put them in a pouch and and chew on them to, to give me some energy, because uh, I really needed to, uh, you know, kind of kind of get kind of get out of there, you know. Um. So I went ahead and bed it down again, not far from that. Uh, that shrub next morning you know I got up and walked back onto the trail and the bush that was loaded down with the cocaine leaves there wasn't a leaf on it so sometime during the night the creature went to that bush of all the bushes in the um the jungle, he went to that bush, he took every bit of the cocaine leaves off. All right, so not far from the bush, there was, a, um, you know, the river. And I went into an, a, rock, a rock quarry, you know, it was, um, um, I would imagine... The, the Mekon River, Tony Sap River, uh, had had um, had washed out a slough back there, um, and um, there's a pile of rocks and there's a a big tree that had fell across a, a a gorge there, and um, apparently this might have been. I'm thinking it might have been an old base camp for the for the rebels there. Can you please um um why why do you think the the creature took all the cocaine from the plant? Well, I'm I'm getting to that, James. Okay. I apologize. I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of building up. Um, so I get back to where what I believe to be an abandoned. Uh, rebel camp um, and um, you know I, I bet this time I, I already know you know another night in the jungle uh, you know experiencing all the other bodies that had been mutilated this guy hunts and he hunts uh, he's in the trees and that's how he hunts and you know when I was with um, uh, that girl, there is what the uh, the shaman told me. She's repeating the line of what the shaman said back when I was in Laos. Um, but getting back, James, um, you know, I need to build a raft, but I don't think I have enough time to build a raft. I mean this this creature is going to come back and uh, my radio that I had um, like I said um, it, it you know it was out of range um, at that at that point you know um, being so far away from the uh, the original drops uh, point um, so what I did, uh, I went ahead and uh, took the ammo and, um, you know, put it in a tree trunk. And sure enough, he came back and um, I ended up falling into uh, the slough and slid down into the river. And... Um, when I got into the river, I 
swimmed up on the bank and I, you know, I was covered in mud, you know, getting the, um, you know, uh, getting back onto the bank. I just covered up in mud and got up on her uh, old, uh, um, down by an old down tree and he had jumped into the river um, to come after me and um, what he had done uh, I went ahead and got up on got into the to the trunk of the tree I'm, I'm covered in mud and um, when he got up on the bank he went right by me he was with maybe as far as from you to the lamp, your lamp in the background there in your house. He was that close to me and he could not see me. So what had happened, the mud that I had uh, on my, had smeared on my, my body, uh, camouflaged the, um, had, cam had camouflaged me. And um, and I realized that you know, hey, he can't see me. I right. he walked right by me. Well, at this point, you know, uh, after he left, uh, went ahead and mud it down real good, cause I'm you know I've mud it down before when I was uh, with the Hamong tribesmen to keep insects off. And I never did use insect repellent when I was in Vietnam because I was always concerned a tiger would smell me. But um, but on that, when I first went in with the 506 Air Cavalry, um, you know, uh, they didn't do that. You know, they, they wore their mosquito repellent. I never did do that. But I went ahead and mud down, you know, and um, he couldn't see me at that point. But I went ahead and made a crude uh, arrow, a spear, and uh, took the ammunition and uh, got some leaves and made some um, little uh, uh, fire bombs, little, little, little explosives like uh, firecrackers, more or less. And uh, but he seemed to hunt off of heat. The helmet he had on, uh, he hunted by body heat. Uh, so what I did uh, that night, when the sun went back down, I got up in the tree, and uh, I threw the. I, mean, I had taken a torch, had built uh, a bond. You know, I'd taken some sticks, logs, and, um, you know, threw, the, threw the, the torch down and started a bonfire. And I gave a big holler out, a, a war holler. And um, so he knew by that point, you know, hey, you know, the fight's on. You know, I'm going to come get you. I'm going to come get you. That's, that scene there is very realistic. Uh, what I saw when he came out of the water, the, 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 how his suit was re, uh, acting up from the water, the little, that rodent is, I had that by me. Um, but getting back to that night, uh, once I start the bonfire, I, I crawled up in a tree and I'm waiting for him. And, um, Next thing I knew, you know, he's in tree with me. He he had a tendency, I don't know how he did it, but he would always try to come up behind me. He crawled right by me again. He could not see me, but I could see him. He was in within arm's reach when he climbed up that tree with me. And um you know, of course, you know, I swung around to another tree and, um, you know, tried to, um, you know, to, uh, to shoot at him with a crude, with a crude weapon. And that just pissed him off. 
pissed him off bad. He, he couldn't see me, but he knew I was in one of the trees. And you know, how, tall, how tall was he? What would eight, you guys say? eight foot. He he was about he was about eight foot, and I would say a good four hundred pounds. He went. You know, I'm going to get to that scene in a minute with the beating that I had to incur. Uh, but he he had a you know the weapon that you see in the movie. Uh, he did have that on his shoulder, and when he started firing it, James, I, I the firepower that was coming out of that weapon, he was he was taking down trees. I mean, you thought he was shooting a 105 millimeter shell. That thing has as much power as as a Sherman tank. Now that's how powerful that weapon was. It would shoot out little balls of light. And and it would just like I say, it was snapping trees left and right. But um, he hit the tree. Eventually, hit the tree. You know, if you knock all the trees down in the jungle, well, eventually he's going to hit the right tree. He hit it. He knocked me out of the tree. That's what I saw right there when he went by me, that close. So when he knocked me out of the tree, you know, uh. I fell down into the water, you know, a uh, pool of water there, and it washed the um, the mud off of me. And uh, by that po point, he could see me. And, you know, like you see in the movie, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he, he goes up to the tree trunk or the, or the log and the creature slams the fork knife down. Well, he did the same thing with me. He picked me up, and he just picked me up, put me against a tree, or, or, you know, um, and he, um, he looked me over. He looked me over. Um, but what had happened prior to the beating? I'm going to get back to that. Prior to the beating. I had taken some of that cocaine and chewed it, and it was unusual. It was this cocaine was very unusual, because the cocaine that I've always uh, took when I was around Manuel Noriega uh, is very addicting. And then you have, um, like I said, you know, you get withdrawals from uh, the cocaine that Manuel Noriega had. This cocaine had none of those features. This cocaine was like super cocaine. And uh, and even after you, the withdrawal from the cocaine, you don't have any type of drug addiction. So I don't know if that plant uh, had been tampered with, but it, it seemed to have uh, some unique characteristics to this cocaine. I believe that cocaine is what he was chewing on that gave him the strength that he had. But um, going back now, um, when he turned my head, um, he walked away just like you see in the scene. He drops his we he drops his weapon off his shoulder and drops his helmet, and that was when he. Dropped his helmet. That's when I really saw his face. And I just said, you know, you're one ugly motherfucker. You know, you know, I mean, he was, he was, he was um, ugly. And he stunk. And that's another thing about it. Um, he had a real bad stench to him. Um. Uh, he smelled like rotten fish. I presume that's the reptilian in him. But he had an awful stench of, of that I've smelt. And you see him walking slow. That's what he was doing. And if you look at Arnold Schwarzenegger when he's when he's getting the shit beat out of him, Arnold sounds like a little boy. Well, that's me. I'm just a kid. That's why you hear Arnold Schwarzenegger sound like a little boy. Cause I'm like I said I'm, I'm um. You know, 
just just barely uh, 16 years old. Okay. Now, as far as the log dropping down, what I did, uh, that seems a little bit off there. What I did in that little ravine area that I had set the trap up, what I did, I uh, hacked away at some of the tree there where it was, uh, it was already at about a 40, about a 45 degree tilt. So I just weakened the tree by taking some of the wood off of the, the top of the tree. And, uh, and the log, that's what fell on them there. But uh, that part about where you're spitting up the blood, um, that's, that's the type of blood I was seeing. It would, it would glow in the dark. Uh, I, he had it when I, you know, first time I wounded him, um, he, uh, when, when I threw the spear at him back in the cave. So the part about the cave part is, is very realistic because he always would come up behind me. He's very hard to hunt. But um, when he was late, James, when he was there dying, um, and this is what really has, you know, I've had over 50 years to think about it. Uh, and I said, well, what the fuck are you, you know? And he reached over to the little band on his arm. And, you know, he was typing in uh, to the little band like you would type into, like you'd like you text somebody, you know? And uh, it gave out uh, a low tone and, and it just repeated back, well, what the fuck are you? You know? And um, so while he was there dying, he, he started laughing. He started laughing at me. And that's, that's not a good sign. And the band that he had on, you know, went into some type of a countdown uh, mode. And it, you know, by that point, you know, I'm, I'm ready to get out of there. Uh, I don't know what's going on with this, some type of a, what his, what his armband is getting ready to do. And as I was running away uh, from him, I had some type of electrical, uh, an electrical disturbance was going on. And what was happening, it, it was similar, like I said, to a Tesla coil, except it was more like lightning shooting from the ground up into the sky. And it was uh, similar to a, a spider web. It was getting larger and larger and larger. And as I was running from him, uh, trying to get down to the other ravine, I had uh, I could feel these uh, pelting going on my back. Similar like you would go out before, uh, like you're getting ready, you're in a rainstorm, and it's raining real hard, and you feel the raindrops pelting you in, the, in your back. All right, so I'm feeling some pelting going on in my back, and then I jump down into the ravine, and there was just a massive explosion, and the, you know, I'm below uh, the the land area there where the blast couldn't couldn't hurt me but what happened the blast and it was more similar to a thermal barrack explosion now for people who don't know what a thermal barrack detonation is it's the strongest device that you can pack that's not nuclear um, it's a specialized uh, explosion but, uh, but it's not electrical. I'm just comparing it to a thermal barrack explosion. And um, the, the, uh, when, it, when it blew, there was a big mushroom that came up. And this is just right about dawn when it happened. And... Um, there was a helicopter, like I said, uh, that was trying to go up down the river. They, they thought I was out in the river. And when they saw the mushroom cloud that came up, 
you know, they knew that, hey, you know, there's something going on, you know, here. So that's how, um, like I said, it opened the jungle up where a helicopter could land. There was no place for a helicopter to land until the bomb went off. So once I got back onto the helicopter, you know, I'm real, I'm really, I'm not doing good. I've taken a real bad beating, James. Uh, you know, I, like I said, when he was beating me, he, every time he hit me, he would pick my feet up off the ground. And, um, and he was just like knocking me around like a rag doll. But once I got back into the helicopter, they're going to fly me back uh, south into... Uh, Jimmy, did the creature actually look like what we saw in the movie with all the little snake things, the, the dreadlocks coming out of it? And the I would say that that's about... It's very realistic. It hit the... Uh, it is very realistic of what he looked like. Now, I've, now since then, I've killed only one other one. I killed one up in New York, and an he was underneath an abandoned uh, a meat uh, a cold storage, uh, a, a meat uh, factory, you know, where they butcher meat. He was a he, he had a craft. And don't and I don't ask me how he did it. I don't know how they did it, but he had a spacecraft that was underneath an abandoned warehouse. Uh, how they did that, I don't know. Unless there was an underground um, tunnel or underground base underneath Chicago, but there was one one other one I've since killed. I've only killed two in my life. And and both of them showed up uh, in the film Predator One and Predator Two. Now in Predator Two, he threw a uh, a gun at me, and that gun it was basically an old flintlock. It came off an old smuggling ship called the Black Swan. Uh, and if you uh, watch the movie Laws Dharma, uh, there's a ship. Uh, called the Black Swan. It's in Lost. Have you ever watched Lost, that sci-fi um, series? Type in Dharma Initiative. Uh, you can you can find it that way. Uh, but let's let's move on. Oh, I don't want to get too off. The How did a helicopter uh, pick you up if your radio wasn't working? He saw the explosion. Okay. It, it, this this was similar. It was similar in nature to a thermal barrack explosion. He he opened up that jungle, and it probably changed the course of the river because it was already in a little slough to begin with. It uh so what happened was the river just it just changed the course of the river and it went back into the slough. He opened the slough back up, so the course of the river was was changed. And in fact, for a while there, the river flowed north instead of flowing south. I mean, the explosion had a strange, and I'm going to get into that. This is something very unusual. The explosion magnetized me very heavily. I was like a capacitor. Okay, so when I got flown back down into South Vietnam, uh, they brought me to a corpsman, and, uh, you know, I'm walking, so it's not like, you know, um, I don't even think they, if I remember, I don't even think they had CAT scan machines back then, but, or, uh, but, but I was walking, but um, I had, when they got me down towards daylight, uh my shirt, which it, the explosion, like I said, you know, I didn't have a shirt on. I had these strange welts on my back and um, on my arms, these, this, this, this welting. And, um, and when the corpsman took an IV, uh, you know, I laid my arm out 
for him to stick the IV into my arm. When he tried to put the, when he was getting ready to put the IV into me, he, uh, it was electrical discharge. He got shocked real bad. It's similar like if you're, like you have some cheap carpet and you're barefooted and you walk across that carpet and you reach over to touch something, you ever had, you know, like an electrical discharge on your fingers, you feel a pop, you ever had that happen to you? Well, I was, ele I mean, I was electrified, and two or three times he made an attempt, and after about the third or fourth attempt, he said, look, I, I, can't, I can't give you an IV. So I ended up having to take the IV that he laid down, on the table and had I had to insert my own IV in the arm to get some um, uh, plasma because I was you know pretty dehydrated I had taken a horrible beating James and uh, so for you know I took a bag or two and um, you know um, you know I was real sore for for a couple of days there just barely moving but one of the strange things that occurred when I would get around a radio, um, the radio uh, that interference. Uh, but if I moved away from the radio, the radio would act normal. Now, back then they had old tube fluorescent lamps that were in the ceiling, and I could walk down a hall, and with the even with the lamps off, there's no power to the fluorescent tubes. When I would walk down the hall, the fluorescent tubes would light up, and it's kind of like a bulb, you know, like you know, you got a, a bulb going out in a a, a fluorescent lamp. Uh, it flickers, you know, well the the electrical bulbs in the ceiling of the uh, the building would would blink. So I was heavily magnetized. Uh, if you had taken a compass and put it in front of me, and I moved my hand around the compass, I could make the, the compass uh, spin. So you know, after a couple of days, a week or so, you know, I'm feeling a little better. I'm still sore, and I got up, and, you know, hey, you know, I'm ready to get something to eat, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and try to go back to, to work, and I went down to the nuclear power plant, and I'll never forget this, uh, the scientists all got scared, the physicists, and they bolted the door to the nuclear power plant, and they wouldn't let me in. Uh, they were scared because I was magnetized or had been magnetized and uh, they wouldn't let me in to go get any food. So, you know, you know, I'm in daylight and I've had a terrible beating and here are the scientists and the, the physicists and everything and they're scared to let me in a nuclear power plant to get something to eat. So, you know, I went back to the um, to the container unit. We had all the uh, the radio equipment in, you know, and AC rations, and you know, eventually, um, you know, got to feeling better. But the only way how I got demagnetized, one of the somebody had taken had taken a, a rag that had some diesel on it, and I had picked the rag up um, to um, wipe my hands off. And when I wiped my hands off, the hairs on my arms lay, start to lay down. And, you know, when you're magnetized, your hair stands up on your arm. It stands up on your, your head. I ended up having to take a diesel rag and wipe my body completely down from head to toe. You know, even my, you know, my pubic hairs. I had to take all that and wipe down in diesel. And that was the only thing that demagnetized me. J Jimmy, uh, can you please explain why you had to go to the nu nuclear power plant to get food? <clears throat> well, you know, I 
what the other guy, you know, when there wasn't a whole lot down there and the food was much better, you know, I just kind of followed him in there. <clears throat> he he knew that the, the scientists, the physicists, you know, they got some pretty good meals. He was just, like I said, he was um, freeloading off of, them, you know what I mean? Uh, just being like a neighbor, like, you know, their, their uh, facility was down the street from, from us, and there wasn't really a whole lot on that street. And, um, you know, I could have gone down to the mess hall, but like I said, you know, uh, uh, he was eating pretty good, so I just followed him in. But, you know, like I said, when I scared the physicists so bad, uh, once they piled the, the furniture up to the door, they, they, they would say, G.I., go home, G.I., uh, uh, you know, go home, G.I. You know, they were terrified of me because they, uh, you know, they had never seen anything like it, you know. Uh, they didn't know if anything was malfunctioning in a nuclear power plant for that matter. So when I, when I look back at it, I, I really don't blame them for what they did. But, you know, there is no area. I mean, there is no Project Blue Book. Uh, all there is is the nuclear power plant, and uh, all of our people that really did know, that really were in the know, was back in the states uh, around Nellis Air Force Base, uh, Hallam Air Force Base. Uh, those are where the uh, the Area 50, 51 folks all hang out. You see, um, the only other person I knew in Vietnam uh, that were Area 51 was. Um, well, you had David Corso. I mean, him and um, Duncan O'Finn has been back in uh, Cambodia. But I don't think, like I said, when I was with Duncan, you know, we, um, you know, we do we use our psychic abilities, and um, you know, uh, we sent out an electrical pulse. Um, me and the other kids did. We joined hands and sent out a a, a pulse from um. Uh, that, that killed uh, six or seven thousand of the the Viet Cong, but that metal band that uh, we put on our heads, it went to a metal, it went to a box that came off the spacecraft, and it was basically a telepathic weapon. Uh, we could operate this. Only thing Duncan was, he was he would aim it, but it was basically uh, a box that came off of a flying saucer. Um, that um, it was a telepathic weapon is what it was. Okay, so other than for, for Duncan and David Corso, the only other person I knew over there uh, was um, Bill Cooper. Now, you know, Bill, um, he was the old um, a, a patrol boat captain, but I don't think he was... Uh, in that part of, of Vietnam, I think he was uh, probably further north uh, towards Saigon. Um, so he wasn't even in that canal system or that river system where I was at. This was just by, I was in, I was just closest to where this plane went down. Okay, that's all I can explain. But as far as, uh, uh, Project Blue Book. Uh, Vietnam did not have a Project Blue Book. Uh, what it was was basically private contractors that serviced the radar systems. Uh, they came from Area 51 that set a t container up. And uh, so, uh, you know, Vietnam... You know, as far as the, the flying saucers attacking the PT boats and then attacking the, the Australian uh, Hobart, uh, nobody didn't think that uh, the Vietnam War would drag on that long. And they weren't prepared for, for, uh, for that. But wars attract these creatures. They feed on negative energy. And... Um, and that's what I found out. You know, they use the jungle. Uh, they like wars. This, that's, that's what, if you die a violent death, they, they like, 
they like, they feed on a negative energy. And that's why I say about the temples, you shouldn't try to channel because uh, they will uh, attempt to, uh, they, they want you to think that you're talking to another human. Uh, and so you shouldn't try to channel um, stone statues. Uh, there's a reason uh, that there are stone statues. There's a reason you see all those strange uh, uh, pictures on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Great Pyramids of Egypt. These are genetically modified uh, creatures.